Hey guys, it's Mr. H once again. I am the floating head in the corner. Um, I'm going to try to record this video. This is about maybe part way to three quarters of the way through chapter 27 um, as far as the uh, quick little review goes in the corner of Cengage. Um, I want to do this in advance just in case I do lose my voice because I am going to... Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to fold. These sinuses are, are getting ridiculous. So I'm trying to record this so I don't have to do this in person. But uh, let's talk just a little bit about um, a few things that we didn't get to in Chapter 27 the other day. Um, one of them being when you're charging the battery. So a lot of this stuff is par for the course. You've already used this in your task sheets. But here are some of the main things that I kind of want to hone in on that maybe were not mentioned in some of the task sheet packets or mentioned by me when you guys were going through some of the task sheets. Some of them being, you know, keeping the charging voltage below 15 volts. That's very important. Most of the machines you guys are using, you're not going to really have to worry about that. There's fail safes involved, and usually a battery is not going to get that far. But just in case, rule of thumb is you don't want to go above 15 volts. Anything that's above that, um, you can risk damage to both your charging machinery as well as overcooking the battery, which is never good. You don't want to overcook the battery. Um, the longer you can keep a battery on a slow trickle charge, um, the better off you are. So let's say if you have a battery that has been depleted, um, maybe even more than 50%, you're trying to bring that battery back to life. The longer you can keep that on the battery charger, the better. So don't expect, you know, if you have a battery, oh, within 15, 20 minutes, if I leave it on a, you know, a small two amp charge, it should be perfectly fine. I should be able to use that in the vehicle. No, if, if you can, leave that on the, the battery charger as long as possible and on a low amp setting. So notice they don't really say that up here. Um, you know, generally longer the better, but try to leave it on a low amp setting as long as you can, especially with a, a battery that has been depleted um, more than 50%. So, you know, you've got something that's less than 9 volts, um, you know, and you're trying to weigh your options if you're going to need to get a new battery or not. Try to leave it on there as long as possible. And uh, this one, oh, there we go, this one that's here, <clears throat> there it goes, it's going, I feel it, it's going, um, but testing after charging, so when you're using that machine, and it says on some of these screens, you'll see on the, some of the newer ones, maybe not the ancient ones, um, but the newer ones it'll say, you know, um, battery voltage or battery too low for testing, you know, charge and retest. Um, this is almost like a joke, if, especially if you're like a flat rate technician. Um, this is what you should do, um, and it's mentioned in the book, is, uh, you know, testing the battery after charging. Wait four hours before retesting. You don't have four hours. Not, I, I, unless you have, you know, a whole entire day's worth to keep that vehicle and you know you can work on things in your bay in the meantime um, usually you're not gonna have four hours um, try to at least get maybe 30 minutes to an hour and usually you'll have your answer by then if that battery can be brought back to life or not but the four hours yes that is probably optimal but it is usually not possible in your field and line of work unless it is a vehicle that can just stay there for a while and you don't have to worry about getting to it right away. But some shops, that's not possible. Sometimes, you know, customers need vehicles right away. Sometimes you're swamped and you just need to get a vehicle out. Four hours is not really practical in that aspect. But it's mentioned, so make sure you understand that the longer you can keep the battery on the charge, the better off it is. Okay, and then we talk a little bit about sulfation. So lead sulfate in plates become hard and resist recharge. So as plates, inside a cell or as a part of that element, as it says in chapter 26, um, as over time, a lot of the lead sulfate in the plates become very hard. Because remember, they're, they're almost that sponge lead is what they call it in chapter 26. So it's a sponge lead is what they're calling it. But over time, just due to charging and depleting and then charging and depleting, all of that is a natural act. Um, it starts to resist recharge. So I'm not talking about shedding the plate material. I'm not talking about, you know, losing the specific gravity content, whether you lost a lot of water or, or vice versa. I'm talking about the plates themselves. They eventually start to resist a charge just because they become hardened. It's harder for the electrons to flow back and forth um, when the processes are taking place. So that's another thing. So sulfation 
that is a natural occurrence in a battery, especially your run of the mill, um, you know, car battery that, that runs off of 12.6. Um, but that is something that is a normal act. Um, you know, the ones that are not normal, you know, remember vibration, and, uh, you know, having low fluid content or overcharging a battery, those are things that are going to kill it um, faster than just normal wear and tear. But this is normal, so sulfation is a normal act. So you have a battery that's over like five to eight years old and it starts to go out. It's not holding a charge as well. Odds are wrong. It's a sulfation problem um, if it's just a natural occurrence. So don't forget about that. Now I'm going to attempt to do, there we go, we move through the next screen. Oh man, <clears throat> hopefully the doctors can do something about that. Okay, battery charging. So slow charger is the only way to complete a recharge uh, a battery. The only way to completely recharge a battery. Okay, that's like kind of like a loose term. Um, a slow charge, you can do a fast charge, it's just it's not as beneficial and you may risk cooking the battery if you try to bring it back to life too fast. So just think about the conversation we had yesterday where I was talking about, you know, having somebody who was, you know, out in the cold so long that they're now hypothermic. You don't want to just throw them in a hot shower. They'll go into shock. Same thing with a battery. If you have a battery that's been depleted too long, you don't want to fast charge. You don't want to see, you know, crank that sucker up and see if we can bring it back to life. You'll, you'll make the battery go into shock pretty much is what it comes down to if you're trying to relate the two. Um, the slow charge is the way to go. Try to slowly give that trickle of amperage back into the battery. If it accepts it, great. If it doesn't, obviously, you know, even if you put it on a fast charge or try to bring it back to life as soon as you can, it, it's not going to work anyway. So I agree, the slow charge, but like I said, it's not always something you're going to be able to do. Um, impractical unless batteries removed from the vehicle. Yes, that can be true too. So we talked about, um, well, actually I talked about um, the trickle charge, you know, good for maintenance battery charge. Um, you know, a lot of the battery tenders in the shop, the only time they're going to, you know, add a little bit of amperage to the battery is just when it sees it starts to fall below that threshold of 12.6. It'll just give a little bit here and there. It's not going to constantly charge the battery though. Because that, like I said, the killer of a battery is overcharging a battery. Um, so eventually you start to cook everything out of it when you overcharge a battery. So um, battery tenders are a little different. That's just to maintain um, and get a little amperage when needed. Um, that is a difference than just having a battery charger and putting it on the charger. So a tender and a charger, they're two different things. Remember that battery tender and battery charger are not the same. Can you get assemblies that can probably do both? Yes. For all intents and purposes, a tender is just meant to maintain that voltage in the battery and only give it to the battery when needed. And it's a very slow and low charge as well. So we're talking about, you know, two amps or so. Battery charger, that's when you're trying to actually bring that battery back to life, get it going. Not something you're going to use long term. And then we, you know, analyze battery information and adjust the charging current and voltage. Obviously, that goes into play. Okay, storing a vehicle. When a vehicle is left for a month at a time without being started, so let's say, you know, um, my stepdad and I's 1950 Mercury. Obviously, that is not on the road every single day. Man, that would be a lot of breakdowns. Um, but when you have a vehicle that's in storage or something you don't get out a lot, maybe it's a, like a summer vehicle or it's a, you know, weekend vehicle, track day vehicle, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, the battery is still being discharged. As long as it's hooked up, in a circuit, it, it's going to be discharged. Um, Half-charged batteries can often start an engine during warm weather, but you could probably count that out during cold weather. That's when you're just going to probably get the click, click of the solenoid because it doesn't have enough of that voltage and amperage to control the high amperage side of the circuit, only just enough to control the low side to where, you know, okay, we make the magnetic field to pull that switch closed, but there ain't enough on the high side of that circuit to do anything. And that's why you hear the rapid but anyway, in warm weather, you might have a chance. Um, it is hard on the battery. Presents extra challenge for the alternator. Yeah, anytime you have a battery that's going out, one thing to see is, especially when you're on your task sheets and you're checking the charging system, you're always going to see out in the real world, if you're doing your trouble tree, it doesn't matter, they're always going to ask for a known good battery, especially, you know, uh, even if it's condemning a PCM, you know. Make sure the power and grounds are good to start with. Make sure you have a known good battery. That's that's always going to be in there, a known good battery. 
but it really does hurt the alternator over time. If you have a battery that is just not accepting a charge and you know it's low and the alternator is now doing the work of both the battery and its normal job, um, you can take out the alternator later down the road too. It's not uncommon for you to have a battery that has been bad and then for it to finally make the alternator slash charging system fail as well. Sometimes they do go hand in hand. You know, I've seen it where you know, the customer comes in for a battery and then you know, a month or so later they come in for a failure of the charging system. Sometimes they do affect one another. Just because the alternator is taking the brunt of everything and trying its hardest to give back to that battery, you know, give it back that Gatorade of electrolytes, but it's just not happening. So sometimes there's a lot of stress on the alternator and it can come back to a failure. Disconnect the battery anytime it is not being used for 10 days or more. That's a good rule of thumb. I, I pretty much agree with that. Um, battery capacity test. Battery conductance testing means um, a quick look testing if a battery can conduct current, which is very easy. Um, indicates the amount of battery plate surface available to react to chemicals with electrolyte. Obviously, this is easy. Remember, guys, this is Chapter 27. This is mostly about the hands-on portion that you guys already did. So I'm not going to go into huge amount of detail with some of these other ones, but I will focus on the ones that are worth taking note of and making sure you know. Um, new, new battery conducts about 110 to 140% of its CCA reading. Um, can detect shorts and opens and circuits and cells. And is reliable and may give false uh, positive results. Every now and then, no, no machine is perfect. I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, we were talking about load testing batteries, and when you're taking the snap on machines, the red ones, and you're going in um, and you're turning that dial and trying to let back, you know, just like right off a little slower to see if you can get to half the CCA ratings of that battery. So that's what you're testing the battery at. Um, and you're, you're watching. So the battery capacity test uh, can be done to a battery with at least 70, 75 state of charge, 75% state of charge so what that means is you don't want to run this test on a battery that is not almost fully charged it'll fall flat on its face because remember with a carbon pile tester you're adding a lot of resistance in between there you're really trying to push that battery through its paces if it's already weak because it is not storing the amount of voltage it should it is going to fall flat on its face and it is going to appear to be a bad battery or you're just going to get that magical information uh, on a screen saying battery too low for testing recharge and then try again so always do that um, take that into consideration volt amp tester use some of the shops battery load tests yep have volt meter ammeter um, carbon pile rheostat amount of carbon flow usually in cables use a sense of inductive pickup so we talked about how inductive pickup worked in chapter 25 and um, earlier so I'm not going to go too much into that either. Um, typical steps of battery inspection, visual inspection. Obviously, if you have a battery that looks like it's bloated and about to blow up, um, yeah, not a good sign. You know? <laughs> Open circuit voltage test. All you have to do is just get a meter, say 12.6 or not. Very easy. Cranking voltage test. You're seeing how much amperage that battery is allowing to go through the starting system. Battery voltage bounce back test. That goes into also the carbon pile testing portion of it. You know, obviously, if you have tested it, it drops to, you know, 9.6 and then goes lower, and then it just doesn't come back to 12.6 or 11 or even 10. Um, yeah, I, I really shouldn't have to say it, but you get the idea. And then battery recharge current test. So those are the ones that we're talking about. Um, amp clamp, we've kind of gone over why they're used, how they're used. You guys already had that worksheet where you explained it to me, um, but here they're just showing. Um, this is the VAT40. You've probably seen this antique in the shop over in the corner um, where, where the uh, open bays are and the S10. We do have them, but you guys have used the red ones in the meantime. But they're showing you the enough pickup or amp clamp. Remember, for the battery test, it really doesn't matter which cable you go on. But once you go into the starting system and charging system, then it does matter. Then you do have to follow the arrow that's printed on there. That's a big one. And then the rest is about parasitic drain, parasitic load draws, and stuff like that. I'm going to hold off there because we're at just about 15 minutes, and I am out shot with what I can do with my voice. So thank you for paying attention. Thanks for listening. There will probably be a worksheet based on the stuff that I said to take notes of. 
I'll see you guys later.